everybody, this is Bob Sorrentino from Italian Roots and Genealogy, and I have the perfect guest today for this Columbus Day week, and yes, it is Columbus Day, uh, Joe Arazi, uh, the author of Little America. So welcome, Joe. Thanks for being here. Hey, thanks so much for having me. Uh, no, my pleasure. My pleasure. So certainly want to talk about the, the book, and I, I know you have plans for a mini-series. Uh, but before we do that, uh, what's your family history, your roots, and where did you grow up? Um, I'm originally from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, my um, Lots of my ancestors settled in Pittsburgh uh, when they came here. My grandfather on my mother's side, Giuseppe Fosca, um, came from Calabria and uh, settled in the Pittsburgh area, as did many of, or all of his brothers and sisters, I think there were like nine in total, uh, who came in the late 1800s. Uh, and um, I grew up there in a very large, active, um, loving uh, Italian family, typical Italian family that um, uh, spent a lot of time around the dining room table and uh, a lot of time telling stories uh, about the old country, uh, and and actually, if truth be known, um, you know that was um, uh, that was me sitting at the feet of my grandparents and great aunts and uncles, and uh, in preparation, I didn't know it at the time, but in preparation for writing this book. Uh, but um, we. Um, we eventually moved to my my family eventually moved to southern New Jersey uh, the same year I went away to college I went to Villanova and uh, at Villanova I studied at a double major English and theater and um, I, be, I, I stepped up my writing in earnest I, I, I wrote ever since I was young but I stepped up my writing in earnest uh, at Villanova and ended up following that doing a lot of theater um, some television um, and uh, uh, some film, and uh, you know, it's it's it, it, it's funny um, if I could sum the reason for all of this up into one word, um, it would be passion. Um, I I I, um, I grew up um, in a family. Passionate people, and uh, you know, in the mid '50s, early '60s, we spent a lot of time, as I said, around the around the dining room table. And um, I remember, in particular, my my grandfather, this Giuseppe Fusca. Uh, we would cram ourselves into his dining room, eat and drink for hours, and inevitably. The mandolin came out, and there would be singing and laughter. And as I watched my grandfather's face, it would turn redder and redder. Now, admittedly, some of that might have been the whiskey, but <laughs> um, his eyes would well up. Uh, and he would sing, and the tears would start flowing. Passion. Mm, yeah. I know exactly what you mean because that's why I do it. I mean, I discovered my passion later. I mean, I was researching my family for about five years before I retired. But then since I retired, I mean, this has become, this is what I do, you know, uh, try to interview people, authors like you, and, and but just regular people with their stories because they're all so interesting to me. So now your family went to Pittsburgh. They came before the turn of the century then. They came pretty early. Oh, yeah. My, my grandfather emigrated... Uh, in 1898, um, and well, but, you know, a, a, all of his brothers and sisters came right around the same time. Some a little bit later. Uh, he he. Um, our our name our, our our family, like I said, is from Calabria, and our name is Fusca, F-U-S-C-A, and there's an accent over the C, so that it's Fusca. Um, well, when he came in, they wrote it right in in in. Um, Ellis Island, but his other brothers and sisters, when they came over, they thought that was an F-U-S-I-A, that the C with the accent was an I. 
So most of my family call themselves fuchsia. Mm. And my brother and sister and I call ourselves from the Fusca family. And every couple of years we have a family reunion somewhere in the country. And uh, there's, there's, a, there's a battle between <laughs> the Fusca name and the uh, fuchsia name. And so that's, but that's not, that's not uh, typical for Calabria to have that accent over the sea. So they, was it, were they originally French or something? And you know, I don't know that. Um, I, I don't know that. Uh, I, I, uh, um, because there's also a lot of people, a, a, a Fusco, F U S C yes. S C O. Right. And then it's also Fasco. I mean, I've heard all, you know, all different things. So that's quite interesting. So now do you know what, industry brought them here were they were they doing something in Italy that they did when they came to America it was the industry of poverty <laughs> um, you know as as much of um, southern Italy uh, endured um, back uh, in, uh, in the, the peninsula of, of Italy um, uh, was broken up into many city-states in the 1800s. Um, but beginning in 1815 and going to 1871, they created a one kingdom of Italy and Sicily. Uh, there was unification and with Rome as the capital. And there were some civil wars and the Mezzogiorno, which is the area south of Rome, among which is, is is Calabria, they tried to um, they tried Piedmontization. They called it. They wanted to northernize, and they um, re uh, redistrict lands and took some land away. And um, po poverty ran rampant, particularly in Calabria, where you know they would live in tufa limestone huts. That were built into the side of um, built into the side of mountains, and they had a walkout basement, and uh, that basement also served as um, uh, a stable for the livestock. They lived above the livestock. Think about that. Um, and um, they had a one-room house. Uh, it had uh, a fireplace that ran um, uh, spring, summer, fall, and winter. In the winter and fall, it was for heat. In the spring and summer, it was so the smoke would keep the mosquitoes away. And they would have a piece of uh, meat about this big, maybe, every six weeks. And they made do with, uh, uh, with, with a lot of vegetables. And, and it's funny because the stories, I told you that, you know, my, my family used to sit around the table and tell stories and tell stories about the old country. But... They never talked about this. They never talked about the poverty. They never talked about why they came over. Um, um, but um, later in life, when I had the um, fortune to be hired as a, a writer and uh, associate producer for a documentary called Prisoners Among Us, I started to really research my ancestry, all of our ancestry, and um, started to learn the truth of the Exodus, why 4.1 million Italians left Italy um, and, uh, and what they endured so that you and I can sit here right now. Um, and uh, um, it, it was, it was eye-opening for me. While I thought I knew um, the history of my ancestors, I had no idea. And it's, it's, it's really the reason um, I wrote the book. Uh, but uh, before the book was the documentary, um, which is uh, Prisoners Among Us. It's uh, uh, about Italian-American immigration, assimilation, and the largely unknown events leading up to World War II. Uh, and you can, by the way, you can watch it free on Amazon. Um, oh, that's good. Yeah. It, it, directed by my good friend Michael Delaro. Michael Delaro is a brilliant documentarian, and uh, I was introduced to him by my brother Chris, who 
um, owns a uh, recording studio and he does a lot of uh, radio, TV and film soundtracks and he produces people's albums and he's a composer and arranger. He introduced me to Michael. He had worked with Michael. In fact, they both won Emmys. Uh, and um, uh, that's when I began to understand what my ancestors actually endured. And I, I know I get on my soapbox, but um, it's really important for us, for all of us to understand our history. We need to understand our history. Um, we owe that to our ancestors. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And, uh, you know, funny you mentioned the caves because we were in Matera a couple of weeks ago and visited, you know, a, a cave dwelling there. And uh, it was just blew us away that the people, the, you know, the way you described it, they were living like that in 1958. Oh, yeah. 1958. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's just, just so, so incredible uh, to be think that people will live in, like I said, with the animals, with one room for the animals and one room for the people. And, uh, you know, it, thankfully the Italian president at the time moved them all out. And now, you know, now Matera is becoming a rich, now it's becoming a place for rich people uh, more than it is for poor people. Uh, well, it's kind uh, of funny because I uh, have some friends who just got back from um, a trip to Calabria uh, going to the beaches and the villages and the mountains and 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 I, I saw some pictures on Facebook and it was spectacular, you know. Oh, it's so incredible! It's yeah. so so incredible. I, I mean, I had no idea when we made our trip last year. Uh, my um, my grandmother's uh, father's family they actually they were nobility. They own land in Calabria. I mean, and and, and Naples and places. But we went to the to two towns in the mountains there, and it's just spectacular. And um, the you know the the people there are so much different than us. I mean, they're in these small towns. They're very happy. They enjoy life. They enjoy food. The food is fresh. It's not. It's nothing comes in a package in those places. Now, right. have you been back to? Have you been to Calabria? I'm assuming that you probably have. Been. Yes, as 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 a matter of fact. Uh, when I was in my freshman, sophomore, and junior years in high school, uh, and, and, and which uh, they they uh, um, we we rode horses to school back in those days, and and uh, it was it was a long time ago, put it that way. But but um, uh, freshman and sophomore years, we lived in London. My father worked for a management consulting firm and took advantage of the offices in, in Europe. So we, we lived in London for a couple of years, but junior year in high school, we moved to Milano in Italy for, for that year. And while we were in Italy, we did a lot of traveling, including Calabria. But back in those days, it, you know, everybody in the, in, in, in the towns we went to were related to us, you know? And uh, I, I can remember going into one town uh, and we were driving a Ford Fairlane, you know, which was an oddity. And, and the whole town, it seemed, was like tra coming behind the car. And we would go to the largest garage uh, next to a house in the town where they put out tables. And, and we, we must have had 50 people there eating um and 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 singing and uh it was the the electric was turned off at five o'clock in the afternoon um and they went to the well for water uh, uh but they were the happiest people in the world at least back in uh that was 1966 67. but you know they they, they still are when we went to when we went there um they put out a, a spread. We went to two towns. We went to uh, Fasado and Montebello. And in Fasado, uh, they set up this whole picnic with you know tables and like I said, everything was everything was made there from the olive oil to the cheese yeah. to the, the capicola. I mean, everything was made by them. Um, the you know the wine, of course, and uh, it was just super. And like you said, they spent the whole day with us, singing and dancing and showing us 
games that they played 300 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, you know, we actually did, we were on the land that, you know, was once owned by my family. Uh, it's now owned by somebody else. Um, and, um, you know, it's a big palazzo and the current owner won't sell it. And the, they wanted to buy it. But I said to them, I said, doesn't the owner mind that we're doing this on his land? And they were like, ah, you know, he may come out after a while. And he did. And then he actually asked if we wanted to go inside. And, and I said, of course I want to go inside. Um, but it was sad in a way because that place is, you know, just like a lot of places in Calabria and some of these small towns, uh, nobody lives there. It's in disrepair. You could see what it once was. Uh, and then when we went into the town, the whole street was empty, hmm. but, but there was still furniture and stuff in the, in the houses. So, you know, it was sad in a way, you know, it was right. great, but it was also sad. Um, I must have been really, I mean, I know going into these towns now was an adventure. I must have been something else going back 40 yeah. years, 50 years. It was, it was, you know, my, my parents were, um, um, were, were visionaries of sort to, to take their kids yes. to, yeah. to Europe for that expense, extended period of time. Interestingly enough, after our year, in um, in Milano uh, was 1967. We were scheduled to go to Tel Aviv. Oh wow! For my senior Easy. year. Wow. But that was the breakout of the war. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, we had we had a, 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 an apartment rented, uh, and uh, we were to come back to the states for a little bit, and then and then go start our my senior year in uh, in high school in Tel Aviv. <laughs> Um, yeah, you know, we lived we lived in England in the in the mid nineties for two years. We lived in we lived in Bournemouth. Ah, uh, uh, that was you know a great experience. I mean, my son was a baby and my daughter was a pony, but mm -hmm. uh, it was such a great experience because ah. you don't know, and it must have been great being in Milan because you don't know what it's like uh, living someplace else. Visiting is one thing; you're a tourist, but when you live there, you're not a tourist anymore. No. You're no. you're Resident, you know, oh, totally different. You know, when when we were in England, uh, I don't know. We want to talk about Italy. We want to talk about the book and stuff. But when we lived in England, in the first apartment that we had, flat that we had, it was a little upstairs flat. Um, the electric ran on uh, a meter uh, that you would put shillings yes, in. Yes, I heard that. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I and, heard that. And, and we'd have a little bowl with a bunch of shillings in it. Um, next to where the meter was, uh, and 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 you'd feed it, you know. But if you forgot, you'd be sitting there watching television or whatever you're doing. You hear a click, <laughs> and everything goes out. So you scramble around and put the shillings in. And we had uh, what they call paraffin. It was kerosene paraffin heaters in each room for heat wow. in the winter. You know. So yeah. yes, you 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 appreciate or should appreciate. Um, all, the abundance, even in, uh, even in, in, in lower situations that we have in this country. Yeah. Uh, and it's, uh, it's fine. We didn't have that, but you know, we, we did have to get the TV license. And I remember them asking me, do you want a color TV license or black and white? <laughs> it was, the price was different and they, they would drive around in trucks. Yeah. Um, but uh, so you mentioned the book. Let's talk about the book. Um, you, one of the things that I found interesting about it is it's set in the year uh, that both my grandparents came over. My actually my, my paternal grandfather came uh, probably a little bit before my grandmother, um, but she came in 1915, and my mom's family came in 1915, um, and my mom's family came mainly because. My grandfather had served uh, in the Italian army during the Libyan war. Yep. And my grandmother said, you're not going in the, you know, go fighting again. Um, and uh, so they came over and I think they intended to go back because they left my uncle there, but they never did. Um, so, yeah, so that's what I found really interesting. And the book is about basically three families from three different parts of Italy that went to three different parts of America. Right. Right. Um, the, 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 um, the book is a book of historical fiction. 
um, the, the, the three families um, are composites of uh, my family, people in the documentary, um, other uh, reading and researching I did. Um, I'm a fanatic about historical accuracy. And um, the book actually took 12 years to write. The reason being, without exaggeration, 10 of those years were research. While the characters are fiction, the events, the descriptions, everything in the book is absolutely verified and historically accurate to the point that you mentioned 1915. Yes, they both, they, all three of these families uh, who don't know each other, one from, uh, well, it's a stowaway teenager from Calabria, uh, from, uh, from uh, Palermo, uh, a family from Calabria and a family from Naples, uh, end up on the same steamship um, traveling to the United States in 1915. Uh, and um, they travel um, in uh, steerage, uh, which is the belly of the beast. It's down next to the next to the engine compartment because they couldn't afford anything else. Uh, and um, th this again, my family never told me. Uh, and and uh, there were rapes, there were murders, um, deathly sick for thirteen days of brutal passage. Um, it, it, it was, it, it was an awful ordeal. And then once they got here, the streets weren't paved with gold. Once they got here, they had to actually dig the streets. They had to actually shovel out the sewers. Some of them in New York became rag and bone men. You ever hear of a rag and bone man? I've heard of, I've, I know about the ragman, but I didn't know what, a, I don't know about the bone part. The rag and bone man, what they did was they had these big carts um, that they would pull around the city streets starting at five o'clock in the morning. And they have bat wicker baskets on their backs and the sticks uh, uh, like the guys along the highway have. And they would pick up anything, rags. They would pick up uh, metal, broken bottles and dead animals. Mm -hmm. And they would, at the end of the day, dump them down into a basement and the people would sort them out to see what they could repurpose. And usually you know, the person got paid five cents for the day. By the way, the reason they were dead animals is because they would use the bones uh, to make knife handles. Oh, wow. But those yeah. were the kinds of things um, our ancestors endured. And so one family settles in New York City and he's a tailor. One family settles in Cleveland, uh, and he's a he, he's a construction guy. So he starts out uh, as a stone cutter in Cleveland, and uh, the stowaway um, eventually hooks up with his uncle in Monterey, California, um, who is a uh, sardine fisherman. By the way, I know more about sardine fishing in 1920 <laughs> than any man needs to know. <laughs> it's, it's speaking of research. But but um, the, the, the interesting thing about the book is that, as you said, they're from three different parts of Italy and they settle in three different parts of America. And um, I think that's important because they have different vocations um, and uh, they explore their assimilation in this country from different perspectives. And, um, and it's actually, this is actually book one. Uh, it goes from 1915 to um, 1927 when, uh, uh, with the ex it, it ends with the execution of Sacco and Vanzetti. Uh, which was a seminal moment in um, Italian-American history, which is why I ended it there. I'm working on book two. I'm about 17 chapters in, and that takes these families and their descendants to 1946, 47, whenever year the All-Star Game was in Wrigley Field, and there's a reason for that. But... Um, uh, I guess say I'm like 16, 17 chapters in. I keep promising book two, but the development of um, 
a possibility of this becoming um, a television miniseries um, has has gotten in the way. Um, but the um, the thing that is important to me, like I said, is that our children and our grandchildren understand their history, understand um, uh, where they came from. We, I don't want to get political, but we do not study history. It's, it, it, it is really a sad void um, uh, these days. And so, you know, I, I, I want to try and um, and get this book into the hands of many, many Italian Americans so that they can see what their ancestors endured. So they can st- they can honor them for the sacrifices they made. Uh, like I said, so that there's, there's a Bob and Joe can sit here, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And and and. Um, by the way, you can get the book on Amazon. Um, yep, we'll put El- the links out there, yeah. Okay, it's El Apostrophe America. And uh, the reason it's called L'America is because that's what the Italians used to say. They were going to L'America. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm pretty proud of it. As I am proud of the documentary, the documentary goes into great detail uh, about... Um, uh, immigration and assimilation, and I said largely unknown events leading up to World War II, um, and those events are uh, uh, at when Italy sided with the Axis powers um, at the start of the war. Things changed for the Italian in America, yes, uh, significantly. First of all, Italians were conflicted. They loved their new country, um, uh, and they loved their old country. Um, and some of them thought that Mussolini was the best thing since sliced bread. You know the old saying: "You make the trains run on time." Uh, others considered him a fat clown, um, and so there was a lot of conflict. But the um, government was concerned that there might be a fifth column in this country of Italians, Germans, Japanese, um, who were working undercover to overthrow the government. And so uh, 600,000 Italians who did not get their American citizenship were labeled enemy aliens. There was yeah. my, my grandparents. Yeah. I there have was, the cards. I still have the cards with their photos on it. Yeah. yeah. There was a proclamation issued uh, by um, Roosevelt, uh, and uh, they had to be fingerprinted. Mm-hmm. They had travel restrictions. They had curfews. Um, and some of their houses, if they suspected they were fascist sympathizers, just because they had a picture of Mussolini on their dining room wall or um, uh, because they retained their fascist card, Some of them, um, uh, they would break into their homes. The FBI would come unannounced and um, take their flashlights, their radios, and their cameras for fear that, uh, you know, they would use these tools um, to undermine the government. In worst case scenarios, some were interned. Uh, yes. yeah. There were many internment camps around the country. One of them, <laughs> ironically, was Ellis Island. So picture this. You have the Italian who comes to America for a renaissance through the Great Hall in uh, Ellis Island. And then years later, he's on a cot in Ellis Island um, as a prisoner. I didn't know that. I didn't realize that, that they yes. used Ellis Island. Wow. Yes. wow. You know, my, gra- my grandpa, my mom's parents, they had, by the end of the war, they had four sons in the service. But they, yeah. you know, they were, well, at the beginning, they were branded enemy aliens. Yeah. So. So, so, so that happened. 
Another thing that happened at the start of World War II is they decided, you know what? Um, uh, these Italians may signal subs hmm. off the coast of California. And so they set up um, lines of demarcation that were outside the urban areas of California. Um, they would draw a line. And if you were an Italian without American citizenship and you lived west of that line, you were relocated. And when I say relocated, I use that term loosely. You were told to relocate. Go across that line, east of that line, board up your house. How you live is up to you. Um, and if you have any reason to cross that line for a doctor's appointment or whatever, you had to call the police station and you'd have to be accompanied by an officer to be able to cross that line do your business, and then go back across. Um, the, the fishermen in California who own fishing boats, and this is in the book. Uh, as I said, they have the, the, the guy from the stowaway from Palermo ends up in the fishing business, but um, they, they confiscated their boats and retrofitted them so that they could patrol um, the waters off the coast of California. Uh, and so these people were left without uh, uh, without a means to make a living. Uh, they were given a little stipend, but it was nothing. Here's an interesting and important point. Um, when I was writing the documentary, and I was excited about it, um, I was talking to my aunt, my mother's mother. My mother had died when she was in her early 60s, and... and um, my aunt, her sister, became my mother. Um, so I couldn't wait to tell my aunt Tina about um, the, the documentary, Prisoners Among Us. Uh, and so I was telling her about all this stuff and telling her about internment and relocation and the, the, the boats and everything. And she was stone-faced. She just looked at me. And I thought, what's going on? And then she pointed to me. And she said, Italians aren't complainers. Don't make a movie about complainers. <laughs> <laughs> right. That stuck with me. Um, and I went back and rewrote so that the documentary and ultimately the book and the miniseries are stories of victory. Hmm. Not, oh, woe is me. Not we need reparations, not look what happened to us. Because if, if truth be known, what happened to us happened to everybody. Yeah. If you're yeah. a Native American, your ancestors came from somewhere. They endured the same mistreatment um, in different situations, different experiences, uh, but they endured a lot. As a matter of fact, the poster for the miniseries, the tagline is, it's not just their story. It's your story, too. This is really I, I remember when we did we uh, screened the documentary at the um, New York Independent Film Festival, which it won, by the way. Um, uh, we had a booth and people would come up and talk to us after the after the screening. And there was an Asian couple who came up to me when I was in the booth and they said, look, I know you're Italian and I know this is about Italians but this is about us too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah. It's true. It's absolutely true. Um, but, but, but it's, it's, it, it, it's amazing. Um, speaking of Italians and our ancestors of what, as I said, they endured um, and never spoke about it. When we were doing the documentary um, and we, had, I don't know, maybe 200 hours of interviews in the can. When we were doing that documentary, um, we were using crowbars to pry these stories out of the Italians. They, um, very proud people. Very yeah. proud people. Yeah. And, you know, that's not important. Yeah, okay, we were relocated, but it was only a short period of time. We rolled up our sleeves and went back to work. Um, 
you know. Well, yeah, and that's why it's so important to to hear these things. You know, I I know my friend Anthony. You know, in the seventies, Anthony Riccio, when he he had the wherewithal to interview people that had come in the early nineteen hundreds. They were in their seventies and get their stories about Italy, what it was like growing up, and, and you know, that's my biggest fear um, is that you know we lose all of this. For example, I, did, I had no idea about Ellis Island myself, you know, and I've been around for a long time, but you know, the, the, the younger people are, they're not exposed to that. Like we were talking earlier, what they see on, they see the Sopranos and Goodfellas and they think that's our history. Right. And, and it's, and it's not, you know, I, on the way back from the trip a couple of weeks ago, I watched the, um, the documentary uh, that Billy Crystal did on Yogi Berra. Fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. It was yes. just, uh, I was glued to this because I grew up with Yogi Berra, right? Uh, and I, I actually got his autograph, oh, probably, I don't know, 2010 or something. Uh, it was after he made up with with um, uh, Steinbrenner. And uh, it was like meeting the Pope. Sure. <laughs> I walked up to him with a baseball, you know, Mr. Berra, could you sign up? It, it, that, I, I mean, literally, that's the feeling I had. Yeah. I was meeting a God yeah. because growing up, <clears throat> Yogi Berra, Mickey, Ma you know, but because he was Italian, of course, he he was special, you know. All right. Uh, well, little little inside information about the book too. Um, and I mentioned that it, it it ends in forty. I think it's forty seven, um, which is when the All Star Game was in Wrigley Field. Well, Joe DiMaggio's parents were sardine fishermen yes. in Monterey. They're in the book, and. Joe, as a young boy, hated sardine fishing. He got nauseous at the smell of fish. <laughs> and he always ran off to, 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 uh, to play sandlot ball. Uh, but he befriends Paolo, who is the guy who becomes wow. a sardine fisherman from, from Palermo, because the, the Maggios were from Sicily as well. Yeah. He befriends him, and um, they... they um, uh, well, I, I would just say that uh, uh, the Wrigley Field All-Star Game enters into uh, uh, the end of the book. Uh, yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's interesting. And uh, yeah, you know, they went into that relationship with 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 Barrow and DiMaggio because DiMaggio was, you know, a handsome, you know, tall for Italian type of guy and and. Yeah. and and it was, you know, one of the sad things about Yogi was, uh, and I didn't realize this growing up, but in, they made him a clown, which was, and even later yeah. on, it was very, very sad when I when I saw that. I, I I was really bummed about that when I was watching this thing. And he was a major talent. Oh, super! I, I you know, I remember growing up. You know, I must have been you know seven, eight, nine, or whatever, and. He would hit a ball that was at his ankles, and you know, double, you know, down the right field line or something right. like that. He could hit, and they talk about it. He could hit anything. He could hit. You know, and not I, strike I, out. He never struck out. <laughs> I mentioned um, uh, that. Uh, oh, did I mention, or maybe this is when we were talking be before we started? Um, uh, um, there are certain elements you have to satisfy to get to, and we'll talk about the miniseries. But the pilot has written uh, for the miniseries and worked with um, a guy by the name of A.J. Ferrara, who wrote the pilot. Uh, and A.J. Um, wrote um, a screenplay about Joe Pepitone, um, which is really interesting. Um, uh, you know, the, the, there, there are guy. many <laughs> prominent Italians in the world of baseball, you know. Yeah, and Pepitone was a wild and crazy guy. <laughs> well, that's obviously the re one of the reasons for, for writing the film. He was uh, he 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 uh, he liked to party, you know. Well, yeah, and and I forget which book it was about the Yankees where uh, he uh, he got he got well. Actually, with two stories, he t I remember him telling about Mickey Mantle. The first one was he was a rookie, and they were out partying one night, and and. Uh, they were supposed to play an exhibition game at West Point and th they woke up late. You know, mm -hmm. they were out all night. They woke up late and Mantle told them, don't worry about it. I'll, you know, get a car. And he gets this limousine and he tells the driver, pick up two quarts of vodka and two quarts of orange juice. 
and he drives right up on a field <laughs> with this <laughs> lens for Peppertone. Uh, and then there was another story where Peppertone got him uh, high on marijuana. He gave Mickey a, before the game. Sure. And and he said he said normally when Mickey would strike out, he would throw the helmet, he throw the helmet, he throw the bat, he throw throw things. And he says he struck out on three pitches, one, two, three. <laughs> He said he took off the helmet, put it down. It's nice. He put the bat down. And he said he came over to me on the bench and said, if you ever give me that again, I'll kill you. <laughs> <laughs> um, That's funny. That's but, funny. But, uh, yeah, like you said, there was, was so many. But, I, you know, I always remember Yogi as that guy. Clutch hits, you know, you know, and, and – one thing that they said in the in the uh, um, documentary was um, uh, it was Jeter was talking to him, and Jeter said something to him about, um, well, you know, it's a lot harder now to get you know playing ten World Series. There's more yeah. teams and there's playoffs and this like that. And he said, Yogi said to me, "That's fine. Tell me when you get ten rings." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll talk. Right. <laughs> Um, and he was, you know, he was just a, he was just a fascinating, fascinating figure in the, that we grew up with. Um, so, so now you mentioned that you know you, you, you hope to turn this into a, a documentary, which will be, which will be a mini series. Yeah, a mini series. Yeah, yes, be super. Yeah, that, I don't even know how they found me, but and 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 look you write a book and it gets some i mean it, it, some notoriety some good reviews and that kind of thing and so people start emailing you people start calling you you know uh they they're, they're going to get your book in a thousand bookstores and you know they're going to do this for you and that for you and, and a lot of it is is unnecessary but but um this company uh called Little Studio Films in Beverly Hills, contacted me, said, uh, read your book, and um, we really like to talk. And it's actually a company that's owned by an Italian woman. And uh, 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 she, she, kept, uh, she contacted me, she emailed me, and I thought, ah, that's another scam. But something told me, let's, you know, let's, let me get back to her. So I did get back to her and we started talking and I researched her and Little Studio Films is a legitimate uh, player uh, and um, does a lot of, of uh, global film. And um, so uh, I signed a contract with them to develop uh, uh, America into a television miniseries, uh, which yes, on a number of levels is very exciting. First of all, um, everybody else's story has been told, but mm. the true story of Italian immigration and assimilation has not really been told. We are not just mafia. We don't just own pizza joints and off people. That's not who we are. We have returned volumes of heritage and culture and artistry, um, and, 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 and on and on and on to the landscape we call America. Uh, and, and that story has to be told. Our children and grandchildren have to hear that story. And, and, um, and this is a way of doing that, obviously. So um, I'm excited about that. I get on a soapbox, you know, uh, when I talk about uh, my heritage uh, and I get my back up a little bit when you know, people want to uh, uh, want to turn it to, to to mafia. And look, the truth is, the mafia existed and exists, uh, and there were different forms of mafia. In fact, in my book, the Camorra, which is the mafia in Naples, are the reason why the family from uh, Naples leaves Naples and and, and goes to uh, uh, goes to Cleveland, and 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 the mafia. The Cosa Nostra in 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 um, uh, Palermo is the reason why Paolo in Palermo stows away and goes to goes to New York. And in fact, when he first goes to New York, he uh, uh, he's interested in the Black Hand, 
he thinks he's going to get in the black hand, but that doesn't work. And he ends up with his, his uncle in California. But uh, uh, I am actually going out to um, L.A. again um, uh, the end of this month uh, for a series of meetings uh, to try and, and, and get a deal done. Um, and, uh, it, you know, it's, it, it, it moves slow and there's certain elements that you have to satisfy in order to get to a, a seat at the table with the big boys. Um, we've done that. And so, uh, we'll see what happens. Yeah. And, and, you know, like you said, there's, there's so little real stuff written about that. And, and also, you know, the history of Italy too, like we were talking earlier, you know, they've made tons and tons of movies about Spain and France and England, which is all fine. Um, but nothing about Italy between 1861 and Rome. Yeah. <laughs> Very mm -hmm. little. I mean, there's tons of stuff about Rome, but, uh, you know, people yeah. don't know about the, the French being there, the Spanish being there, the Austrians being there, uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and how Italy became, the culture of Italy became Italian. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's just nothing about it. I mean, look at Sicily, how many times it was invaded and, you know, uh, taken over by people. And, you know, I always laugh when people say I'm 100% Italian and my DNA says I'm this, that, and the other thing. Well, yeah, of course, because everybody had a piece of Italy at some point in time, but it's not told. We don't know about right. it. By the, by the way, I will never have my DNA checked. I'm 100% Italian, from my head down to my feet. I know that. I don't want somebody telling me I got 2% <laughs> <Something> else. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I, I, I say to people, I say, well, you know, there's, there's DNA and then there's culture and heritage. I said, and it's two completely different things. I mean, your culture is your culture and your heritage. Of course, it's Italian. That's where your family's from. Right. Um, you know, one very interesting thing about my mother's family from, now they were both from uh, Torito and, and Bari, and my mother's, uh, my, my mother line is like 97% from the Caucasus. Just, I found that so mm. incredibly amazing. Mm -hmm. And the only thing I, I, and some of that shows up in France. And, and I remember my mother telling me that my grandmother, her mother, used to say that the family was originally from France. But, you know, who knows? I mean, you know, who knows when, how, why they got there. Uh, yeah. But, you know, they came from this little small town in Puglia, um, which uh, I had the best piece of sausage I ever ate there a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, 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 actually, everything tastes better in, in, in Italy. That's right. It just could be the same recipe, the same food as in New York City, but it tastes better in Italy. And actually, I'm going to I'll share a little, you know, I, I told you early on passion. Well, um, I know I'm 100% Italian because I cry equally hard when I land there and when I take off the go. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. I, I was interviewed uh, while I was there by, um, I, I, I think Letizia, I think they were, they're trying to, you know, gear up tourism and everything. And uh, I don't speak Italian. I wish I did. I mean, my vocabulary is, you know, like a two-year-old. Um, but they asked me a question. They said, uh, when you're in when you're in Italy, how do you feel? Do you feel Italian? And I said, well, yes and no. And so they said, well, what what, is, what do you mean? I said, well, I feel Italian while I'm here and walking the streets and everything. I said, but when somebody asks me a question <laughs> in Italian and I can't answer, mm -hmm. I said I feel like an American. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, you know, it, it is. I do envy. Now, I used to speak Italian much better when we lived there, you know. Sure, uh, yeah. Yeah, we had to. And, and I wish I spoke to that level today. Um, but uh, I, if, if I'm going to Italy, I want to, you know, I want to bone up a little bit so that so that I can hold my own. Um, yeah, yeah, you know, you. you you know, you kind of sort of catch on. I mean, there's so many words that are similar. And, and when I was talking to somebody over there, they said the toughest thing about Italian for Americans, or I guess anybody who speaks English, is conjugating the verbs. And they said, don't worry about that so much. 
you know, we have problems with your language because you have so many things that are spelled differently that mean the same thing and right, right. you know, vice versa. But they said if you if you you know if you say you manja and you don't use the right verb tense, we it's, understand. They we know still, what you're talking yeah. about. You and know? the other thing is is there there's so many dialects. Oh yes. In, in yeah. We you know, and I, I my mother's family's from Calabria. Calabrese is like nowhere near real Italian. I, know, I, know. I, know. I asked them, last year, I asked them, they sang a song and I wanted to learn to play it. I said, could you send me the words, you know, send, and they sent it to me and I was like, oh my God, this certainly, this is an Italian. Mm -hmm. um, but then just, you know, when we were there a couple of weeks ago and the, uh, we're in Puglia and the, the driver, you know, we were talking about Parese and, and Italian and he, he would say something in Italian and then say it in Barese, and it was like, whew, not even close. I mean, you wouldn't know that that's what he was talking about. Hey, it's in, um, at the start, you know, because you read it, but at the start of each chapter uh, in the book, uh, I have a quote uh, from some source. And um, one of the, um, one of the chapters is about when the people from steerage on the, on the steamship were, they had had a lot of bad weather and they were finally able to get up on deck um when the sun came out they get up on deck and they break out their bread and and whatever biscuits or things that they had uh, brought um for the for the trip and they break out the instruments um and start playing and uh there is a calabrian folk song uh that they sing uh on the deck of the ship and so Part of the the quote um, at the uh, at the beginning of that chapter is is like four lines, uh, a verse or something from. Uh, it's called the Calabrian Maiden, and um, I had an Italian read the book, uh, or and and she came back to me and said, you know, you, I'm sorry that you published this, but I, that's not real Italian in the book yeah. uh, you've misspelled words and you know i don't even know what this is you need to make this book accurate <laughs> you know and and i'm trying to tell her it's more accurate than you think yeah. you know this is when 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 the calabres are up on the deck singing a song they're singing their dialect you know yep yeah, yeah, and like and like I said, it was like you know when like when they were singing, uh, and because you know my brain when I'm in Italy, so this may be Italian. It sounded Italian to me, but when they sent me the words, I was like, "Ooh, <laughs> this is this is something else completely." Uh, and you know, and and the driver told us he said when he was growing up, I guess he was I guess in his late fifties, early sixties, something like that. He said when he was growing up, they weren't allowed to speak the dialect in school. They had to, they had to speak Italian. But he said now yeah. it's starting to come back. This yeah. is starting to, to bring it back and you know, teach you know kids and people sure. wanna you know wanna understand it and things like that. Um, so before we go, uh, I know you mentioned it before, but where can people find the find the book? You can find the book on Amazon. Uh, it's L apostrophe America, Lamerica. Now you'll find another Lamerica. I forget what it is. And I think there's a Doors song called L'America. But <laughs> but um, it, it's on Amazon. It's also a, on uh, Barnes & Noble's website. But uh, most people go to go to Amazon. Um, I, I would love any Italians or, or anyone um, listening or watching this uh, podcast uh, to go grab a copy. Because yeah. it's, it's, it's important history. It truly is, and I'm not saying that um, uh, in, in any boastful way, uh, but it's important for you to learn what's in there, uh, and 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 um, uh, and it's uh, a uh, uh, it's a situation. Uh, oh, and by the way, if you do that and you do it on Amazon, I would love to see uh, see a, a review. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, it's, it's certainly important to give it to the, you know, the, the, the fourth and fifth and sixth generation uh, Italian Americans, because they, uh, you know, they don't know, they don't, they, I mean, we know, because we lived with the grandparents, we heard the language, we heard the stories, 
Uh, but, you know, they think that uh, they don't realize the hardships that, that our ancestors uh, went through. And, and, and I didn't. I called myself a proud Italian American, um, but I didn't. I didn't know yeah. uh, th th this stuff. You know, I didn't know about steerage. You know, I didn't know about the, the, the what they called the button hook men on Ellis Island who turned their eyelids inside out looking for trachoma. I didn't yeah. know about about a psychopathic pavilion that they built. A four story psychopathic pavilion was built on Ellis Island because when you came yeah. onto the island, if they saw any sign of dementia, you were interned in that building until you were deemed fit to get on the city streets. Well, yeah, or they actually, were, and they actually, you know, because I watched that documentary about Ellis Island, they actually had pictures of people with, with you know, like moron, idiot, you know, next yeah. to that. And yeah. Very disconcerting when you see that kind of stuff. It's, yeah, and, and I mean, try that today. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you know, they would give they would give these poor old people a five piece wooden puzzle mm. that was supposed to be a man's head. And they had a certain amount of time when they came into Ellis Island, they had a certain amount of time to try and make this head, you know, right. And if they didn't, um, they were uh, uh, they were deemed uh, moron. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I know. In, 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 incredible. Incredible. In, that's that. Um, there's an episode in, in the, in the mini series um, that, uh, that, that, that uh, deals with um, that Ellis Island experience. Well, you know, we need to get all the Italian Americans to start pressuring them to actually do this mini series. <laughs> so how okay. we can get the word out. No. We do that. <laughs> okay. okay. I keep you, telling them, you know, I, um, I'm getting older and older and older, you know, the, um, uh, the, the, the fast forward on my remote is, is pushed, uh, <laughs> the, the entire time in my life now. So I don't have much time. Let's get this done. Uh, yeah, no, I know what you mean. I know exactly what you're talking about. Well, listen, Joe, this has been great fun. I really appreciate you taking the time. And uh, for people listening, make sure you go out and get this book. It's a great book. I really appreciate it, Bob. Thanks so much for having me. You're welcome.